Hello, this is Martin Patilla for Life Enthusiast Podcast. And today with me, my favorite researcher into the things health, Spencer Feldman, the CEO of Remedy Link. Spencer Feldman, welcome to the show. Nice to see you again, Martin. Yeah, real pleasure, actually. So in your relentless pursuit of making the humanity healthy, hmm. you, you find yet another angle to pursue, right? I keep trying to retire, Martin, and then I just keep going down rabbit holes and finding new things. So well, let me let me yeah. tell you what I found out this time. Sure, do that. Okay, so, you know, when scientists and doctors began to understand the importance of the microbiome to our health, which is the all the bacteria that's living inside the gut that does so many things. And if you're new to the microbiome, um, maybe, uh, Martin, if you could put a link to our previous uh, talks on the microbiome, that that will explain to you why it's so important. But when we first all started looking at the microbiome, initially, uh, you know, the focus was on probiotic supplementation. I mean, people have been doing fermented foods like kimchi and yogurt for thousands of years. They're helpful. And so uh, that was the first thing that was, um, you know, that was made as a supplement in terms of microbiome. Yeah. Uh, but with, but then they started getting genetic uh, testing advances, and we were able to map out the bacteria in the microbiome. And what we found out was, even with a lot of antibiotics, it's rare that a good bacteria was completely wiped out. Usually it was just knocked down and dormant, but it was still there. So yes, antibiotics and chlorinated water and pesticides like glyphosate really knock, the, knock them down, but don't knock them completely out. Even if you have 1% there, you can regrow it. So, so as you feed it, right? As long as you feed it, right. So they're there in a dormant state usually. So that's the next realization. Since the bacteria are there just in small numbers, let's supply the prebiotics or oligosaccharides that is their food source so they can increase in number. Uh, and prebiotics are really important to you know keep the remaining good bacteria alive. But what we found is that, and we make uh, a product that you carry called Panaceum, and one of the interesting things about panaceum is um, you, for a lot of people, within about two weeks, you, you may find you don't need toilet paper anymore because no healthy animal needs toilet paper. Uh, the, the need for toilet paper indicates your microbiome is ill. So, uh, but the issue is, even if now we find that even if um, you give the prebiotics for some people, until you knock down the bad bacteria, there's no surface area for them to grow and colonize and, and increase. Once the, the bad bacteria gets a foothold in the digestive tract and establishes a biofilm, it's nearly impossible to get rid of it. Um, they're happy to live in our guts, continually generating inflammatory lipids, toxic acids, putrefying amines, poisonous gases, our whole lives. So to regain our health, a lot of us need to knock these bad bacteria down and, and so they'll stop making these toxins and then they can, then we can uh, take the prebiotics to regrow our good bacteria and mm -hmm. recover, you know, reclaim our gut. Okay. So, so there, there are different segments to the gut, right? We have the small intestine and the large intestine, and there are different terrains and different species growing in these two segments, right? Yeah. Yeah, and we're going to go through. We're going to do take a little tour of the whole digestive tract in a second. Oh, I just want to, yeah. So I spent. So basically, what I did is I spent um, what ended up being quite a bit of time going through medical journals and studies, trying to find a way to knock down the bad bacteria. But everything I found that killed the bad bacteria was even more detrimental to the good bacteria. And so eventually, I was like, all right. God, you know, I just, I prayed. I'm like, God, I, I can't figure this out. Yeah, I know you, I know you made something I know, or, or a few things that will go after the bad bacteria and not hurt the good bacteria. Will you please, you know, put it in front of me? And so I'm continuing to go through the medical journals. And then there's this, I found the answer in one single sentence in a medical journal. Uh, and the answer is really simple. Uh, but to understand why to do the protocol that I'm going to share with your audience at the end of the podcast, there's some biology I think would be useful for us to go through first. Yeah, so, yeah. For, you know, um, so there's there's the teaser. Okay, so first, let's talk a little bit about the nature of the bad bacteria that we need to deal with. 
Uh, now, uh, bacteria can be roughly divided into two types based on their cell walls. We have gram-positive and gram-negative. And as a general rule, the gram-positive are good for us and the gram-negative cause trouble. So let's take a trip down the digestive tract and see if this holds true. In the mouth, it's predominantly gram-negative bacteria that cause gum disease and tooth loss. In the stomach, it's gram-negative bacteria like uh, H. pylori that causes stomach ulcers. In the small and large intestine, it's the gram-negative bacteria of the enterobacter class that cause disease. And it's not just the digestive tract either. E. coli can es escape the digestive tract uh, and it's gram-negative and it causes, I think, 87% uh, of all prostate infections and a lot of UTIs. Salmonella can escape the uh, digestive tract. It's gram-negative and it can create gallstones in the gallbladder. Proteobacter is, is gram negative. It can escape a gut and get into the joints and cause arthritis and so on. Yeah. Now, one thing, one thing mm -hmm. that really stopped me recently was I'm look, looking at salmonella typhi. Yes. Typhi. And yep. I'm thinking, why are we calling it salmonella? It's the good old typhoid. Because not all salmonella are typhoid. Right. Sure enough. But, right, like we had recently had this salmonella outbreak up in Canada where 80 people went to hospital and seven people died. Yeah, and oh. uh, we'll get into that too. I mean, as an example, there's good clostridia and then there's clostridia di uh, C. difficile, right? And what is it that shifts uh, a neutral or, uh, or good bacteria to become bad is part of what we're going to be talking about today. Right. So there are, so as we just mentioned, as you go through the entire digestive tract and even into the body, it's most it's the it's the gram negative that are causing most of the trouble. Now there are some good gram negative bacteria, but even these we want to keep to a minimum. Gram negative should be no more, by my reckoning, than ten percent of the microbiome. But for a lot of us, it's fifty percent or more. Now the difference between the gram negative and gram positive bacteria are the membranes that they're made out of. So for gram positive. Their cell wall, their membrane, is mostly peptidoglycan, which is a mixture of protein and sugar. The gram-negative, uh, on, the, on the other hand, their cell wall is called a lipopolysaccharide, or LPS for short, and we're going to talk about LPS a lot. And that's a mix of fat and sugar. Now, gram-negative has a more complex membrane than gram-positive, and this complex membrane makes them much more resistant to almost anything you can throw at them, whether it's a natural antimicrobial herb or an antibiotic. So this membrane is why almost anything we do to knock out the gram negative ends up causing more damage to the gram positive. I guess so, we could call them more fragile, less resilient, because their skin is thinner, so to speak. Um, or the, less less resilient. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, it's 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 this difference in the membrane that makes the gram negative just so um, so resilient. Yeah. Now, it's the gram negative that, as a gram negative bacteria, as a general rule, that create the toxins I've mentioned earlier. That's the inflammatory lipids, lipopolysaccharide (LPS), toxic acids, poisonous gases, and putrefying amines. So let's look at these toxins one by one. Hmm. First, let's look at the inflammatory lipids. The lipopolysaccharide, the LPS cell wall of gram-negative bacteria, is incredibly inflammatory. It's actually one of the most inflammatory things we know of. And it causes all sorts of problems. It causes leaky gut. And what that means is now undigested food gets into the bloodstream along with bacteria that's in the gut can translocate and get into other organs. It causes a leaky brain. The blood-brain barrier will also leak as a result of LPS. It'll cause a leaky heart. The pericardium can leak. Um, it can cause a, le a leaky liver uh, when the peritoneum leaks. And in women, if the peritoneum leaks, now toxins are going into the ovaries and into the eggs because there's no protection. There's no membrane around the eggs. Now, a, a man makes sperm fresh daily. So if some sp happens to be toxic at one point in time, you know, within a month, that's all that cleared out. And now there's fresh, he healthy sperm. A woman has to safeguard her eggs because the eggs she has when she's born or gestating uh, are all the eggs she's ever going to have her whole life. And if a woman has a leaky peritoneum and her eggs are getting toxic, that can affect uh, her, her, you know, her children. Mm. Uh, LPS causes leaky capillaries, which lowers albumin. And when albumin goes down, well, IQ goes down, lifespan goes down, 
uh, cancer risk goes up. Uh, and actually people don't look as good because when you look at someone and say, wow, you've got glowing, healthy skin, you look really great. That's albumin in their skin. So what does the body then do to deal with all these little leaks, all these holes that have been poked in all the membranes? Well, the body uses a kind of cholesterol called LDL, specifically lipoprotein A. And this is considered the, the bad cholesterol. And so there's drugs and protocols saying, let's lower the, the lipoprotein A. Okay, that's fine. But why is it there? It's there to plug up the holes from the LPS. So if you have sticky, bad cholesterol associated with heart disease you, and high LDLs, it's probably gram-negative bacteria. And rather than push those down and leave all the holes everywhere, I think of it as like, you know, if, if someone has got uh, lots of holes in their wooden ship and you go around and you plug it up with little, you know, plugs of wood and pitch, Okay, you could say, well, there's all this pitch on my ship. I'm like, yeah, it's keeping your boat from sinking, right? Don't just pull out all the don't just pull out all the plugs without, you know, you you gotta you gotta deal with the LPS. It's causing the holes in the first place. Yeah. Now, what what else does it do? Um, LPS is uh, highly inflammatory because when the body sees LPS, it thinks, oh, I must have a systemic infection. So the immune system goes on red alert, and to have your immune system on red alert continuously is exhausting and inflammatory to the body. LPS damages the mitochondria, it raises blood pressure, it lowers the Hayflick limit, causing premature cellular senescence, which in other words means we it basically um, decreases the maximum lifespan you have. So, and it does more. I mean, we could spend yeah, all day I, talking. I actually about want it. to plug in a point here, which is the lowering the LDL, right? Mm -hmm the flagship product of the pharmaceutical industry is a cholesterol lowering drug. And they make billion dollars doing it. And you just told me that's just like cutting off the wiring that causes the fire alarm to go off. Well, now you have an understanding of why, even though there are drugs that can lower cholesterol, it doesn't really do much to change heart attack and stroke risk. Yeah, you're just shutting off the noise. Yeah, exactly. Or or your car's got a, 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 a an emergency light showing in the dashboard and you just hit it with a hammer. I'm like, yeah, your light's gone out, but that's not a great idea. Okay, so the first toxin we need to deal with is LPS. Now, the next set of toxins created by bad bacteria are toxic short-chain fatty acids. Now, I classify short-chain fatty acids into three categories, good, intermediary, and toxic. The good short chain fatty acids are acetic acid, which is what vinegar is, propionic acid and butyric acid. And they're created by the good bacteria. And they're all very similar, except that they have two, three, or four carbons respectively. So small, medium, and large versions of the same thing. Those are the good short chain fatty acids. Now you have intermediary short chain fatty acids. These are lactic acid and succinic acid. Now in a healthy microbiome, uh, these get created, but then are immediately or very quickly eaten by other bacteria to then make the good short chain fatty acids. So they're there, but just temporarily. They only become toxic if there's a lack of the other bacteria that would eat them, and then they build up, and then you've got problems. I mean, lactic then, acid has a pretty bad reputation in other ways, right? Well, lactic acid can be great for you, but it's all the it, you know, it's all how much do you have, right? Yeah. Uh, now, there's also, um, and then whether it's the D or the L form, which gets us down another rabbit hole. So then there's the toxic short-chain fatty acids. These are acids like formic acid, which is what's in the, the sting venom of an ant, or valeric acid, or isovaleric acid, and isobutyric acid, things like this. These are toxic short-chain fatty acids made by toxic bacteria. They're often very much like the good short-chain fatty acids, just with a tiny little twist of a molecule, a little change. They're like shadow versions of the good ones. Now, the toxic short-chain fatty acids are highly inflammatory. They imbalance the immune system, cause diabetes, generate ammonia, which leads to brain fog and Parkinson's. They cause heart and liver dam and brain damage. And here's an interesting one. They reverse the Krebs cycle, and that's how cancer forms. Cancer, uh, normally the Krebs cycle takes matter and then burns it to generate energy, which is ATP. Yep. But the Krebs cycle can go backwards, it could go in reverse, and take energy and create matter, which is the mass 
that cancer cells use to build tumors up so quickly. So you don't want you don't want your Krebs cycle going backwards. You want it going forwards. Interestingly, cancer in its cycles produces lactic acid instead of carbon uh, instead of CO two carbon dioxide. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's one of the connections between intermediary short chain fatty acids uh, okay. and cancer also. Yeah. Uh, and you know, there's a couple of um, spots on the Krebs cycle where it's going backwards where it can kind of get jammed up um, and uh, it needs, a, I think, a iron and uh, a certain type of iron in order to completely go through the Krebs cycle backwards easily. So uh, if you're thinking that you want that, if someone thinks that they want to keep their Krebs cycle from going backwards, then um, an iron chelator, uh, you could look at our metacardium product, is something you might want to consider just so it doesn't have an easier time of, of going backwards like that. Uh -huh. And okay. so the mantra of keep your hemoglobin high or keep your iron high may not necessarily serve, right? Right. So you never want your iron high. That's why um, women women before menopause have a lower risk of a lot of diseases than men because uh, uh, they're, they're bleeding once a month. Yeah, right? the and then they hematosis note, right? Uh, you know, sure. Lyme disease is another thing that it happens more after menopause, heart diseases after menopause. And that's the iron coming up. It's highly inflammatory. It's the FE3. There's Fe2 and Fe3, and the Fe3, the oxidized iron, is the really inflammatory one. And actually, um, EDTA, which was found in metacardium, has a really great affinity for the bad form of iron. So um, there's something to consider. Definitely. Now, the next set of toxins I want to talk about are the putrefying amines. These are things you may have heard of, like TMAO, which is associated with strokes and atherosclerosis and heart attacks. Uh, and... Then there's the putrescine and cadaverine. Uh, these are the amines responsible for the smell of corpses. Um, then there is uh, 4EP, and the, what that does, it de demyelinates nerves and, uh, and the brain and is associated with autism and other neurologic disorders. So, um, you know, these, these things are, the, are responsible for the smell of bad fish, bad meat, or corpses. You, you don't want them in their body. Um, you know, the, the, the other thing is if you've got a lot of amines and w in the body, then the body has less capacity to then get rid of histamine, histamine, and then you can end up with allergies and histamine disorders. So if you've got a histamine disorder, you may also have an amine, um, a toxic amine issue going on. Now, uh, rather than necessarily get into all the things that toxic amines will create, and, which is another hour long conversation, just except, you know, just, uh, it would take hours to talk about all the terrible things that toxic amines do in our body. And that could be another talk we do. So what do all these toxic amines have in common? Well, they're all made from animal proteins that weren't absorbed in the small intestine. So cadaverine is made from lysine and putrescine can be made from ornithine or arginine. TMAO is made from choline or carnitine and 4-EPS is made from tyrosine. Now, it's not that eating meat is bad. I eat meat at almost every meal. It's eating more meat than you can digest and absorb. So when you eat more meat than you can digest and absorb, it spills into the large intestine. And then now we have the, the issue of uh, generating toxic putrefying amines. All right. So how much concern should I carry forward taking free-form aminos, including, for example, arginine? It, it depends on the amount, right? How much can your small intestine absorb? When you go past that point, you're getting the toxic amines. So, um, you know, there's, and, and we'll, we'll get into diet and at, at the end of this, and we can talk a little right. bit more, more about that. So the last set of toxins I want to address are the poisonous gases. And these are methane, hydrogen sulfide, and the other sulfides, and uh, ammonia. In a healthy colon, good bacteria make carbon dioxide and hydrogen as intermediary gases, which are then turned into good short-chain fatty acids like acetic acid by the acetogenic bacteria like clostridia. However, if we don't have clostridia to do this, then the hydrogen and CO2 builds up. Now, some of it gets breathed out. Some of it is actually good for you. Carbon dioxide is good for the nerves and hydrogen is an antioxidant. But when it gets to a certain point, then it starts coming out as flatulence. And then some of it is going to start feeding 
the methanogens, which are going to turn the CO2 and, and the hydrogen into methane. Now, methane paralyzes the intestines and will cause constipation and sometimes cramping and can more than double the transit time. So now we've got things you know, going bad in our guts for because they're just sitting there for extended periods of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so methane can also cause um, yeah. memory loss, headache, fatigue, eye problems, rapid breathing, rapid heart rate, fainting, abnormal emotions, and then a shortened hay flake limit, just like the LPS, which is decreasing our maximum lifespan. Yeah. So you don't well, want none methane. Of these, yeah, none of these smell. Hydrogen, CO2, or methane, You, they don't smell like anything. You could have no. flatulence, but it will not smell. That's true. Uh, but the next poisonous gas is hydrogen sulfide or dimethyl sulfide and mercaptan. And those do smell. That's the rotten egg smell you get uh, in, in certain flatulence. Now, these are made when sulfate-reducing bacteria, also known as SRBs, combine sulfur in the diet with hydrogen. Now, hydrogen sulfide and that family of things causes sleep apnea, headache, irritability, insomnia, fatigue, stomach upset, DNA damage, and again, is responsible for the bad smell of flatulence. Of course, it causes more than that. I'm just hitting some of the main ones. Now, the last poisonous gas I want to discuss is ammonia. Ammonia is formed by the deamination or the removal of ammonia from an amino acid or protein. Now, in a healthy digestive system, protein is digested into amino acids and is absorbed in the small intestine. It doesn't get to the large intestine. But again, when a person eats more protein than they can digest and absorb, it gets into the large into the colon, the large intestine. And especially the, in the absence of a bacteria's preferred food source, which is the prebiotics like you'd find in panaceum, the result of this is ammonia or ammonium. Now, good gut bacteria have enzymes specifically to detoxify ammonia, uh, but they can only do so much. And as they reach their limit, the ammonia will go to the liver, and then the liver will try to lower ammonia, and they use the exact same enzymes that the bacteria uses, ALT, AST, GDA, GDS, but the liver can only do so much. And when it gets past the liver's capacity and now the liver's damaged, the ammonia starts to spill into the bloodstream, out of the damaged liver into the bloodstream, and there it goes into general circulation. And again, we could talk about ammonia toxicity for hours, but let me just share a couple of things. It goes in, because ammonia is a mild, um, is, is mildly alkaline, it gets into the lysosomes, which are mildly acidic, and now the lysosomes are shot. They can't do their job of recycling oh, pro, uh, materials. So inside the cells are your lysosomes, and they act as recycling and incinera incineration and landfill centers. They will recycle used cellular materials, uh, incinerate toxins, and then work as a landfill to hold on to toxins they can't break down. And uh, we talked about that in our albidextrin talk. So. Uh, lysosomes are vitally important for the detoxification of the cells, and ammonia will uh, completely render them useless. Yeah, I'd like to give it some sort of a body effect, as in like understanding what that feels like. Because when you're converting ammonia into urea, that's the chemical pathway, right? Mm -hmm. If you have too much of that, you're starting to get gout. Uh, gout, I believe, is uric acid. Yeah. Urea is a different one. Sounds are you sick. sure. So I'm just hearing the words and making the wrong connection. It's just the words are very close. Uh, gout is a is a disorder of, of I think it's purines and they uh, and they form yeah. crystals in the joints. Well, so interestingly, they... just because I ran into uh, gout happening to people who eat too much protein, but also happening to people who eat too much carbohydrate. Mm, yeah, too much insulin, yeah. right? So it yeah. comes from two different ends. Sure. But so okay, so you're saying no, 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 that's not it. That's a different one. It's right. a complicated. It's a complicated. It's the body is a complicated place. So okay, well, the I ammonia. Need to, I need to discern urea and uric. Yes. Yes. So urea is how the body takes carbon dioxide and mixes it with ammonia, and then it turns into urea, which you could then urinate out. And yeah. we're going to go back to what happens if one of the problems that can happen is uh, well, we're going to get into carbon dioxide and, and hydrogen again in a little in a minute, and we'll come back to that. So. 
the ammonia gets into all the lysosomes and damages the lysosomes. It also uh, specifically damaging to the brain and the nerves or in the brain and the uh, and the glial cells, the astrocytes of the brain, which protect the nerves. It's a, a real problem for them for the brain. It causes memory loss, ADHD, insomnia. Uh, the symptoms of ammonia toxicity and Parkinson's are so alike that I tend to think that Parkinson's is ammonia toxicity. Um, Lou Gehrig's disease, MS, all the, a lot of neurologic problems are associated with high levels of ammonia. Now, finally, ammonia is an alkaline substance, and this causes the microbiome, which should be acidic, to become more alkaline or actually shift past seven and become alkaline. And this, it turns out, is the key to the whole problem we started with, how do we get the bad bacteria out? Okay. Um, and it, as a side note, if your colon goes alkaline, you also can't absorb minerals. You know, if you're a farmer uh, or gardener, you know you want your soil to be a little acidic so the minerals can get absorbed. When the soil goes alkaline, the minerals get locked up, you can't use them. Same thing happens in the colon. The colon is where we absorb minerals. And if it goes alkaline, you could take minerals all day long. They may not be absorbed though. Okay. Now, it's so vitally important that the, uh, the pH of your gut, of your stool anyway, be 6.6 .6 or lower, you know, about 6.6, .6, that the good bacteria do does all it can to uh, keep it from going above 6.6 .6 because below 6.6, .6, which is slightly acidic, ammonia, uh, which is NH3, is in the ammonium form, which is NH4. And ammonium is not as absorbable as ammonia. So the good bacteria is going to take the ammonia uh, and try to knock it down I try to keep the pH below 6.6 .6 so the ammonia doesn't, the ammonium, the ammonia doesn't go and doesn't leave it, go into the liver and cause problems, uh, that it stays as ammonium. And this keeps it out of the liver and out of general circulation. However, once the pH goes above 6.6, .6, the ammonium turns into ammonia and all heck breaks loose. Now, specifically, once the pH crosses over 6.6, .6, that's like the Rubicon in the gut the gram-negative bacteria become virtually impossible to get rid of. Uh, and once the gram-negative bacteria get the upper hand, you get the, sh the toxic short-chain fatty acids, the putrefying amines, and the poisonous gases, and the whole thing goes in a, in a downward vicious spiral. Yeah. On the other hand, if you can get the microbiome to be 6.6 .6 or a little more acidic, there's a weakness that the gram-negative uh, bacteria have that we could take advantage of. Yeah. Yeah, so, I would like to just just to bracket this so people understand. There's a lot of talk about, oh, I'm too acidic or whatever. Mm. Now, the different stages of the eliminative system. The mouth is alkaline. The stomach is acidic. The small intestine is alkaline. The large intestine is acidic. So in, mm -hmm. out, in, out, across the divide, right? And you need to understand that actually, actually you need mildly acidic colon. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you've ever canned food, you know that you don't can low acid foods because you can get botulism. What you want to do is can acidic foods or add a little acid to it because we know that the bad bacteria doesn't, uh, there's a lot of bad bacteria that don't do so well when it's acidic. And it's the same for the gut, right? Yep. So at, here's, 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 the, here, here's the, the fun thing that happens. Here's our, our, uh, our light at the end of the tunnel. At a pH of 6.6, .6, uh, what happens is the good short-chain fatty acids can penetrate or actually even get pumped through the membrane the, the, uh, of the gram-negative bacteria. Now, the short-chain fatty acids are mild acids, so they don't trigger an, uh, an alarm inside the gram-negative bacteria, which if they did would create heat shock proteins and then the, the, the gram-negative bacteria would, uh, has mechanisms to deal with that. So it's this mild acid that sneaks on in, and over time, the pH of the toxic bacteria, these gram-negative bacteria, gets more and more acidic until either they die or they go dormant. Uh, the term for dormancy is, uh, let me see, a VBNC, viable but non-culturable, which means it's there, but it's not growing. Hmm. Uh, now, the good bacteria, the gram-positive good bacteria, on the other hand, aren't bothered by uh, short -chain, uh, the good short-chain fatty acids. They have a lot of different ways in which they can deal with them. Um, they can pump them out. They can neutralize them with potassium. They've got a lot of things that they do that 
make it so this, that they're not bothered. Uh, good short chain fatty acid also inhibits gram negative biofilms, knocks out gram negative flagella, which is, so the biofilms are what protects the gram negative from um, the immune system and from other agents that might kill them. Uh, the flagella, it knocks their flagella out, which means they can't move around. Uh, it interferes with their, the, their quorum sensing, which is how they communicate. All in all, good short chain fatty acids in an acidic environment is the holy grail for reclaiming your microbiome from the gram negative bacteria. And this is such a key point, I'm gonna say it one more time. Good short chain fatty acids in an acidic environment is the holy grail of reclaiming your microbiome from toxic gram negative bacteria. In the colon. In, in, uh, well, yes, in the colon. Um, it also, it actually is body wide. Short chain fatty acids well, yes. um, protect against infections across the whole body. But for now, we're just talking about the gut. So that's the key. That's the sentence I found in a medical journal that was a secret to recovering the good microbiome. It's the one thing I found that the weakness for the gram negative uh, that doesn't hurt the gram positive. You can mm -hmm. knock out gram negative bacteria mm -hmm. if your the colon pH is 6.6 .6 or a little more acidic and you have short chain fatty acids. This will kill or suppress the bad bacteria. And then you have a drop of, and then you don't have the toxic acids or the putrefying amines or the poisonous gases they make. Okay. Now, before I tell you how to do that, let's see how this plays out in the colon. Okay. In a healthy colon, we have bacteria called Firmicutes and lactic acid producing bacteria or LAB like bifidus. Bifidus was, is like the, the plankton of the uh, of the ecosystem it's the base it's what everything else um, yes. relies on because what happens is all right so let's walk the two, let's talk about how how the the lactic acid bacteria and the bifidus are like the base of your microbiome the lactic acid producing bacteria make lactic acid which we talked about as a intermediary intermediary short chain fatty acid and this lowers the ph because like like you said coming out of the small intestine it's alkaline right so when the food enters the stomach, the acid of the stomach makes it acidic to break down proteins and, and to disinfect it. And then the bile of the small intestine makes it alkaline. So now we're making it acidic again. It's the lactic acid from the, the uh, LAB bacteria that lowers the pH to 5, 5.5. And what this does is it suppresses the methanogens, which would otherwise make methane, and favors instead acetic acid production, which we need. Now, at the same time, the bifidus, which is also there, directly competes with fungi that would otherwise like to grow in an acidic environment. Uh, bifidus grows, we, bifidus is something called um, an actinobacteria. We actually used to think that it was a fungus because it grows like a fungus, it looks like a fungus. But bifidus as a bacteria grows two and a half times faster than the fungus. Now, you know that the bacteria and fungi, they have this kind of war going on, right? So um, they're fighting each other. So the fungi produce antibiotics. That's where we got penicillin from to kill the bacteria. And the bacteria create antifungals to kill the, to kill the fungi. So when you get the uh, bifidus uh, properly growing, then it can go after the candida that uh, otherwise would like that acidic location in the ascending colon. Okay. So um, methanogens, they prefer a pH of 6.5 to 7.5, which so that's, you take it down and you don't make methane. Uh, all right, so as we continue to move in, into the transverse colon, the lactic acid from the, uh, the, the lactic acid bacteria continue to feed the firmicutes, such as clostridium, and these make the majority of our uh, butyric acid. And butyric acid is now a common supplement because we know that it helps um, with leaky gut. But remember, it's not just the leaky gut. We need to seal up the, the, all the membranes that are leaking, the leaky brain, the leaky uh, peritoneum, the leaky heart, the leaky joints, all of it. Now, as the lactic acid is converted into butyric and acetic acids, the pH rises up to about 6.2 because they're less acidic than the lactic acid, which is highly acidic. And then what happens is in the descending colon, the firmicutes, which are also gram positive, transition into the gram negative bacterioides uh, and acromancia, which is a good version of chlamydia. And now you get propionic acid. And with this, the, lac the last of the lactic acid is consumed and the pH rises to about 6.6. .6. And you've got, out of the entire digestive tract, you have a little section that's gram negative 
doing what you need. Yes, it makes a little bit of lipopolysaccharide, but as long as your gut isn't leaking, it won't go anywhere, and the, and the other good bacteria can deal with that. All right, that's what's supposed to happen. Now, in a pathological microbiome, it goes down a different path. Antibiotics, pesticides, chlorinated water, and lack of breastfeeding lower bifidus in the ascending colon. And without bifidus, the candida gets in. Um, the bifidus may still be there, and, and if you, you, you're still going to have bifidus, but additionally, when you don't have the proper oligosaccharides, the, the prebiotics like you might find in our uh, Panaceum product, um, the bifidus that is there can start making formic acid instead of lactic acid, and then the Krebs cycle can start going backwards, which, as we said, is how cancer starts. The formic acid, along with the higher pH, causes the methanogens to start growing. So now methane is starting to accumulate, and this has a paralytic effect in the intestines. So now everything just sits there longer, and as the right, and and the long, the slower the transit time, the more alkaline the gut gets. So now we've got issues with the oocecal valve because everything's getting paralyzed and damaged, and without enough bifidus and lactic acid levels, the pH rises up to six point zero or higher. Yeah. Now, now, as we move into the transverse colon, the lack of lactic acid from the bifidus and LAB doesn't feed the firmicutes, which makes most of our butyric acid, so butyric acid levels drop, so leaky gut gets and leaky membranes get worse. And the uh, firmicutes uh, get replaced with the gram-negative bacterioides, uh, and so now we're going to have a lot more of the uh, LPS, the inflammatory lipopolysaccharides. Right. Um, the bacteria now as the bacteria, um, so the bacterioides go, bacterioides go up, and then the pH starts to rise above six point six. The lack of short chain fatty acids and the rise in pH triggers the good bacteria to go rogue. And an example of this is good clostridia uh, being replaced with the toxic uh, and pathogenic uh, C. difficile, Clostridia difficile form. Yeah, classic for the um, people who have autistic problems, right? C. difficile is classically found in the gut of people with autistic symptoms. Yes, and highly disturbed levels of gases and highly disturbed levels of short-chain fatty acids. Okay, yeah. so as we move into the descending colon, the pH goes above 6.6 .6 to 7 and higher, and ammonia is now being formed. The, the gram-negative bacterioides growth is further stimulated by the ammonia, and they take the ammonia and carbon dioxide um, and create short-chain fatty acids like acetate, propionate, and succinate, and hydrogen. Now, the issue is the higher hydrogen level and the lack. Uh, there's a the, the hydrogen CO two level is something that is isn't yet talked about. I, I haven't seen anybody talk about it yet in microbiomes, but it's really important because if you have the too much hydrogen and not enough carbon dioxide, instead of making um, acetic acid. Uh, you in turn uh, feed them the methanogens and you make methane. Uh, now this increases the methane levels and then the sulfate reducing bacteria, which eat up you know, two thirds of the butyric acid we have, increases our hydrogen sulfide levels and eventually the bacterioides and methanogens and the sulfate reducing bacteria can't process the excess ammonia and it pushes the, alkaline, uh, the colon into a hyperalkaline state, spills into the liver, causes liver damage, gets into the brain, causes nerve damage, and that's the mess that we're all dealing with. Or, well, a lot of us are at well, some level you know, going down that path over time. Yeah, well, it's actually quite common. Uh, all you have to do is just uh, go to a public restroom somewhere and it won't take you too long to uh, find somebody leaving a horrendous thing behind. Right, so, yeah, right. Um, th that's, that's an issue. Um, you know, this has been getting worse since we've been taking records. Back in 1926, I think the pH of the infant colons was like 5.0 5 to 5.5, right? So now the pH has been getting more and more alkaline with more and more use of antibiotics and pesticides and, and bad foods. Uh, also, as we get older, the colon goes more and more alkaline. So uh, it's a function not only of our environment, but also of age. So uh, another thing that happens is the lack of lactic acid in the ascending colon, uh, combined with the alkaline shift from ammonia production in the descending colon, can trigger the growth of pathogenic neutrophilic gram-negative bacteria. Neutrophilic meaning it likes a neutral pH. 
So that's bacteria like E. coli, salmonella, typhoid, pseudomonas, and then like the rogue gram positive bacteria like C. diff. These like the near alkaline conditions. And so when this, you would this be on a blood test when you look at neutrophils that's, that they usually check in labs that that's where they show up? Okay, so neutrophil is different than neutrophilic. So in the uh, same same phrase, neutrophilic is a bacteria that likes to live in a neutral in environment. Neutral. Yeah, okay. Whereas a neutrophil is the mac the white blood cell that moves around and eats things. So, okay, so that's the bad news, right? Um, the good news is you can return your microbiome to a healthy state. And here's what we want to do. We want to clear bad bacteria from the mouth because if you have bacteria in the mouth and you're swallowing it all day long, it's constantly, it's like, a, it's like the opposite of a probiotic. It's feeding bad bacteria into the gut. Uh, you want to restart lactic acid production in the ascending colon. You want to reacidify the colon. You want to increase the short chain fatty acids. You want to shift the gram positive towards, uh, you want to shift the gram positive gram negative ratio back to gram positive predominantly. You want to get rid of the fatty acids and poisonous gases, get rid of the polyamines, and then reclaim um, territory for good bacteria to take over. I know that's a lot. So let's start at the, at the top, in yeah. the mouth. So using alcohol-based mouthwash is just a terrible idea because alcohol kills gram positive, the good bacteria, more than it kills gram negative. And then when the alcohol starts to evaporate at a low enough level, alcohol will actually feed gram negative. So people get addicted to mouthwash because they take it and their mouth feels clean. But a few hours later or later in that day or the next morning, their mouth is, they have less good gram positive and more bad gram negative and they need the mouthwash even more and they get stuck in a vicious cycle. So don't use alcohol-based mouthwashes. Um, if you have access to a medical grade ozone machine, you can ozonate water and rinse your mouth out with that. Ozone is the only disinfectant I'm aware of that does more damage to gram negative than gram positive. However, well, I guess you could suggest then uh, maybe the uh, hydrogen peroxide or no, any... uh, no. no, the only one is ozone, not really? chlorine, not chlorinated disinfectants, not hydrogen no, not peroxide. Chlorine. I'm sure of that, but I'm thinking hydrogen peroxide. No. Mm -hmm. Nope, it'll, it'll do more damage to good to gram positive. Okay, it's just ozone and nothing, no other disinfectant will do that I'm aware of. Okay, the other option is there are certain polyphenols that you can use. Now, polyphenols normally knock out good and bad bacteria, both. However, we've been eating polyphenols for so long in our diet that our good gram-positive bacteria have gotten used to them and it can actually eat them. So there's two polyphenols that I like. Um, that's elagitanin and gallotanin, and we have them both in our Elagica product. Yeah. So what you can do if, uh, is um, you can open up a capsule of Elagica before you go to sleep at night kind of swish it around your mouth. It's going to give you a very stringent feeling in your mouth. And then when you wake up, see how your mouth feels, see how fresh it feels. Because what we've done, what you're doing is when you give polyphenols or specifically those two types, you're feeding the gram positive and knocking down the gram negative, which is exactly what you want. Okay, there's the mouth. Now, number two, restart lactic acid production. The best way to increase bifidus is not to take bifidus, although you might need it if you've completely walked it out, the best way is actually to feed the bifidus. And you can do that with our panaceum and also with um, resistant starch. So what you can do is, uh, uh, if you're not allergic to nightshades, cook a potato or cook any starch and then refrigerate it for 24 hours and then eat it cold. Uh, don't, don't heat it up. What happens when starch is cooled is it goes into a crystalline structure that becomes a kind of prebiotic that specifically feeds bifidus. Uh, the no. other thing is... So the good old potato salad, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, you also might need to knock down some candida if you really want to su support the bifidus. And if you can tolerate it, you know, peop some people like uh, Saccharomyces boulardii. Um, you can also add coconut oil to your diet because uh, that's antifungal. So the good old sauerkraut is not necessarily the remedy here, huh? Uh, well, you know, sauerkraut is going to give you a, an increase in histamine. Um, it is going to acidify the gut. Right? It's going to have lactic acid in it. That's great. But you've got to feed the, the bifidus. Uh, yeah. By the time you've made sauerkraut, you've already used up all the fuel to make the short-chain fatty acids. You yeah. need to put some of the fuel it's in. It's just need lactic products. acid and bacteria. Yeah. Which is fantastic and wonderful and great, but we need more. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, the next thing is we want to, there's a, there's four more, there, now then there's four things in a row we're going to talk about. We want to reacidify the colon, increase the good short chain fatty acids, uh, shift to a gram positive dominant microbiome, get rid of the toxic fatty acids, and then poisonous gases. Actually, I guess that's five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. All five of these are actually accomplished with a single protocol, and that's a short chain fatty acid enema. So if you were to take <laughs> yes, the magical word, that's, a, that's, that's what you've been waiting to hear. That's, that's the magic protocol. It's two ounces of acetic acid, butyric acid, and propionic acid, uh, properly mixed in the right ratio with a few other, you know, other things. And what that does at the right concentration will both reacidify the colon and deliver the good short chain fatty acids, which as you know, that takes us back to our, our one key sentence, good short chain fatty acids in an acidic environment will kill gram negative bacteria. So uh, when you take the short chain fatty acids uh, rectally, you are lowering the pH, you are increasing the short chain fatty acids, you're knocking down the gram negative bacteria. And when you do that, you, you knock down the, the production of toxic short-chain fatty acids, the LPS, poisonous gases, the ammonia and methane and hydrogen sulfide, and the um, toxic amines. So remember, the, the, these toxic gases, the ammonia, methane, and hydrogen sulfide, uh, they really only start getting produced in massive numbers when the pH goes above 6.6. Uh, .6. So uh, let's see now. Now the toxic yes. amines. I guess well, that, let's let's just uh, put it here. So to find out what the pH is in your colon, is you need to take some of your feces and put a um, I don't know pH meter or pH paper on it, right? Sure. What you do is you go buy some six to eight pH paper, and you're going to have to defecate like on a paper plate or something, a little sample there, and put on a glove and press this the pH paper against the stool and hold it there for a few seconds. And unless you've got very, very dry stool, which is then it's going to be a challenge, there should be enough moisture there to, to make the pH paper change a color. Yeah, even and if then you, you push into the middle of the... Water. Yeah, I guess if you, have to, if you have to break it in half and get into the part that's a little, a little damp. Yeah. Thank you. Great idea. Okay. So that's where you're going to check your, your stool pH. And that's something that is vitally important to know about your health. If you've got a, you know, a child that's going through colic or something, or you know, you've got a, uh, just... It's such a simple thing to do and so profoundly important for your health to know your, your stool pH because we've already talked about all the things that happens when it goes alkaline. Um, number seven, the toxic amines. These can be addressed in the same manner. Um, however, if you want to completely get rid of them, you have to make sure you're not, absorb you're not getting protein spillover into the large intestine. So again, don't eat more protein uh, than you can absorb. And then the last thing is to reclaim the territory. Right? Once the bad bacteria have been killed or gone dormant, once the pH is normalized, providing now now is when you can uh, start taking probiotics, and now is when the prebiotics are really going to do their their best good, because now the good bacteria is in the right pH, and it's got the food to eat, and it's got a place to to, to set up shop, and it can uh, displace the bad bacteria. Uh, so, what does this protocol look like? So again, you're going to check your stool pH, and I like to see a pH of 6.5, 6.6. .6. Um, it's hard to know what a perfect stool pH is because I haven't seen, and I've looked, any data on the pH of perimeter hunter-gatherer tribes. Um, we know that at 6.6, .6, you start to make ammonia and methane. So I'd say 6.6 .6 is, is, is the, the Rubicon. That's as high as you want and maybe even a little, a little more acidic. You need to be below it. Yeah. yeah, so I don't know how much below because you can go too acidic, but I would say 6.5 is probably where I'd aim. Now, the next thing is, so you've got your pH paper. The next thing you're going to need is a, a rectal syringe. Now, don't use an enema bag or a squeeze bottle. Just trust me on this. You can end up um, putting air into your colon, which is uncomfortable. Um, what you do is go online, and for a few dollars, you can get a 60 ml catheter tip syringe. Or if you want a more comfortable experience, uh, you can get a 50 ml glass rectal syringe with a rounded tip. Next, you're going to need the short-chain fatty acids. So uh, if you want, make your own blend of short-chain fatty acids. But if you're not confident about the ratio and concentration uh, and the other things you might want to put in, you can get our Phylomet blend, 
Phylomet is the name of our product, and it contains uh, all of those sh good short chain fatty acids, but it's um, it's very concentrated, so you can make uh, a lot with it. So don't use it undiluted. Follow the instructions on the bottle. Okay, so you get a fresh stool sample, and you press the pH paper against it, and you look at the color key on the pH paper, and you know your stool pH. If your stool pH is already 6.6, .6, congratulations. You might want to take um, the uh, phylumet orally as a supplement at the right uh, concentration. Um, but at 6.6, .6, you probably don't have to take it rectally. If it's above 6.6, .6, then you could consider taking it rectally. And so first, what you want to do is make sure you've emptied your bowels. And then second, make sure that you have a few hours where you can relax and be near a bathroom. Because the first few times you take it, you can dump a lot of toxins out of the liver. Um, you can have a lot of, uh, some things can come out of you that you would want to have access to a bathroom for. Yeah, you didn't even know you carried it around. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you mix the phylum it as per the directions um, with, a, with some warm water and you take it rectally. Now, I understand nobody wants to do an enema, but this isn't a quart of water like a, a retention enema. Uh, this is 60 ml or two ounces. So assuming you have decent bowel control and you've already gone to the bathroom, once you inject it in, uh, you know, you, you don't have to be laying in a bathtub or anything. You can uh, go about sit down. Yeah. I wouldn't say the first few times you do that, you go and get in a car until you know <laughs> how your body's going to react. Because uh, the first few times can be, can the first, the, the reactions you get the first few times is some things can come out of you you weren't expecting. Um, I can just visualize the person who has the urgency happening at the wrong time. Yeah. 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 Yes. So um, you can sit down if you like, but the best way to do it, if you can, is to lay in your back with the pillow under your hips. So your hips are a little bit above your belly button. So there's a downward slant. So the, uh, the phylumet goes and goes across the whole um, descending colon. And then after about five or 10 minutes, if you can turn to your right side, uh, then what can happen is it can go across the um, transverse colon. Okay. Now, you know, you could do this daily for a week, but every time a day you do it, um, check your pH. And you can also take, if you're taking it rectally, you can also take it orally at the same time. Now, once your pH gets to 6.6 .6 and stays, uh, then you can stop taking it rectally and just uh, continue orally if you like. But keep checking your pH, because if it starts going up again, um, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't caught yet. It hasn't, you know, it's sort of like, you know, trying to turn on a, uh, an engine that hasn't turned run properly in a long time. It runs and then it sputters. You want that engine fully turning over and running because once that engine is running, once you're making all the short chain fatty acids you need, and once you're feeding it with prebiotics, it will take care of itself, but it, it can take a little while to do that. How long? It depends on how alkaline your gut is and how long you've had the problem for and you, you know how many of your good bacteria you've knocked out. All right. If you're squeamish, you should know in advance that certain parasites don't like short-chain fatty acids. So if you see some worms with a drop of blood or two because you know they will let go of where they were biting on the colon and sucking blood, if you see a, you know some worms and a little drop of blood well, in the toilet, well, that can happen. The good news is you're not going to see them typically moving around. They're stunned. Now, uh, if you're a microbiologist listening to this, you're probably thinking, wait a minute, it takes a pH of 2.4 to kill parasites. You're not suggesting we use something that acidic in the gut, are you? No, I'm not. But you don't have to kill the parasites, just like you don't have to kill the bad bacteria. Many, right? It's almost impossible to kill the bad bacteria, but you can make it go to sleep. And as long as it's dormant until you die and are a corpse, then it can take you, right? It just shouldn't be going after you while you're alive. Well, it's the same with parasites, right? Parasites are typically filled with viruses and bacteria and toxic metals. You don't want to kill them because then they break down and release all that toxic junk. They're like a dump truck into your body. Much better to get them to leave the body with all their toxins and look for greener pastures elsewhere. So that's what the, uh, the short-chain fatty acids do. They're not necessarily killing the parasites. They're just saying, hey, this... You know, they're they're looking for corpses to decompose, just like the bad bacteria. They're, so if yeah. you're full of putrescine and cadaverine, then yeah, they're going to hang out. But if you're not making these toxic gases and toxic um, acids and and 
putrefying amines and your pH is normal and there's short chain fatty acids there, they're going to be irritated and they're going to be like, I don't want to be here. And they let go and out they come. So you might find that. Um, if you, uh, as a side note, if you end up seeing a lot of worms come out of you, you might consider our electron charger putting that over the abdomen because that's uh, uh, worms don't like electricity either. And you could consider taking notoplex rectally, um, serapeptase rectally for some reason is the only one of the only ways I've ever seen to get rid of liver flukes. While the mainstay of the protocol is using uh, short chain fatty acids rectally and in some cases orally, there are some dietary things you can do too. Okay. So again, the first thing is you can eat resistant starch, specifically high potassium resistant starch, right? So that would be the tubers uh, or potatoes or sweet potatoes. Um, or... So um, the reason you want to do the resistant starches is not only they feed uh, the bifidus, which we need to prevent, uh, to get the ascending colon turned back on, but potassium is one of the main ways that makes that our, our good gram positive bacteria is resistant to the short chain fatty, fat, fatty acids. So you wanna make sure you have potassium in your system. Now, resistant starch alone by feeding bifidus, for some people, that's all they need. And some people, it'll decrease the fecal pH from 7.2 to 6.6, .6, and that's it, and they're good. Uh, it just depends on how badly the microbiome has got wrecked. Now, another thing is you wanna eat organically because the pesticide glyphosate, uh, in addition to causing brain damage and leaky gut, kills gram-positive bacteria. Three, don't go on a low-carb diet, at least not for very long. Carbs feed your microbiome. Even good bifidus will make toxic formic acid, which is, as we know, uh, is what triggers, can triggers cancer, if the carbohydrate gets too low. So what I do is I do low glycemic carbs. So I do um, things like beans, um, but you can also do higher glycemic um, things like oatmeal or potatoes or sweet potatoes if you refrigerate it because what you're doing by turning it into the resistant starch is you're lowering like glycemic index. You can also put a little bit of oil on it and that'll slow its digestion too. So you can take a higher glycemic index carbohydrate and make it lower glycemics by refrigerating it for a day and putting a little oil on it. Another thing is at least initially minimize gluten. That's wheat, rye, and barley at least until you've knocked the gram negative and lipopolysaccharides down because gluten is uh, also uh, for some people can uh, cause leaky gut. Um, all right, don't overdo fats. Remember in the beginning, the lipopolysaccharide membrane that's so inflammatory that gram negative bacteria, their membrane is made from is made out of fat. It's made out of sugar and fat. So you want to minimize your fat, you want to minimize your fat fat absorption, because uh, if you eat too much fat, it will make lots of gram-negative bacteria. So what we are finding in the uh, book of metabolic typing is that we have some people who have adapted with through their ancestors to be mm -hmm. more on the hunter-gatherer type of a diet, which is higher in protein, higher in fat, mm -hmm. lower in starch. And then there are the others, which are totally not doing well on a higher fat, higher carb diet, and you need to adjust it to, to the genetics, to the genetics of your ancestors. There are right. definite differences between what one person will find optimal versus another. Yes, but that's all based on primitive people that didn't have access to antibiotics that wrecked their microbiome. So what I would say is, and so, you know, first get your microbiome dialed in, meaning don't eat a lot of oil, which feeds the gram negative. Once your microbiome is healthy, sure. If you want to eat more oil, great. It won't be making gram-negative bacteria for you. Uh, another thing is don't eat more protein. So what I do uh, is I'll put like a teaspoon of oil on every meal I eat. I like oil, but and I like to eat more, but I don't. Um, don't overdo uh, protein. Don't eat more protein than you can absorb. Um, yes, you can do a carnivore diet, but then you're going to make ammonia. So... Uh, you know, that's I an eat. interesting, interesting point you're making. And yet there are, you know, thinking of Jordan Peterson and his family, mm -hmm. who's very famous for eating beef. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Right. I wonder why or what's okay, going on. So their microbiome is so shot. I'm, well, I'm not a medical doctor, so I can't make that diagnosis. If someone's medical, if someone's microbiome is completely shot, 
then any carbohydrates they eat is just going to start creating toxic short chain toxic short chain fatty acids uh, and toxic gases and just be a complete mess right so for some people with a completely shot microbiome it's better to have no microbiome than a bad one and so they just stop all carbohydrates and just starve their entire microbiome mm. but what would happen what will people like this do if you know five ten years down the road their body becomes allergic to meat because they're so full of high uh, ammonia that their brain and liver are starting to have problems and now they can't eat meat now what can they eat right so i would much rather see uh people who are in that position that say oh i can't do any carbs i would much rather have them recover their microbiome and all the benefits it has so they can eat a healthy amount of carbs and also when you know it's a more enjoyable diet not eating meat only all day long uh but yes you know some people that's that's why they went there because yeah. the microbiome is so completely shot and they don't know how to turn it around as i'm suggesting with short chain fatty acid enemas that they can't do any carbs whatsoever all right so jordan if you're watching this um consider a short chain fatty acid enema uh see if you can get your height or your ammonia levels checked your, your tmao levels checked and if the, you can get your microbiome to be recovered, you may find that you can start eating other foods again. Uh, don't drink chlorinated water. Chlorine is one of the many disinfectants that kills gram positive more than gram negative. If you can, go for a walk every day. This isn't diet, but it helps move your transit time. Because um, remember, the slower your transit time, the more alkaline your stool. Alcohol, if you drink it, it also makes stool go alkaline. So there's, you know, the general health things. What I would say is, if recovering a healthy microbiome were the only thing that short-chain fatty acid enemas could do, that alone would be a miracle. But they actually do so much more. Uh, good short-chain fatty acids double the speed at which the body heals by increasing gene transcription, and I'll explain how that works. Your DNA is all spooled up, uh, and in order, it contains all the information that the body needs to make proteins and fix things and grow. Uh, and what there is, um, in order to repair or grow, aspects of the DNA need to be accessed, uh, and that's called gene transcription, and then now you have the instructions on what to do. However, without enough short-chain fatty acids, people end up uh, with an imbalance in uh, at their DNA level, and they don't get as much gene transcription going on. So they end up actually having less access to their DNA. Uh, that's why when people take short-chain fatty acids, we, uh, you see uh, a more than twofold increase in the rate in which brain injuries heal. It's uh, gene transcription. So a short chain fatty acids double the speed, if you're low on them, will double the speed at which your body can heal. Uh, short chain fatty acids stimulate the vagus nerve, which helps us stay happy and relaxed and uh, gives us the um, rest and digest versus the fight or flight. Uh, they are ketogenic, so they help normalize glucose levels and body fat levels. So, Colon pH has been rising, like I said, since we've been keeping records in the 1920s, and also goes up as we get older. So while we may start with a 10 to 1 ratio of gram positive to gram negative, by the time, you know, we're, uh, as we get older, it will invert and people will often have more gram negative than gram positive. So our modern world and our age both push our colon uh, alkaline, and that sets the stage for all these troubles we've been talking about. And now you can check it. Very simply, you don't need a $500 stool test, although they're great, just a little pH paper. And if you find that your pH is above 6.6, .6, you, know, you might kind of consider our Phylomet short-chain fatty acid enema product. You make it sound so nice and so easy and so simple. And actually, surprisingly, it is. Yeah, yeah, it, but it took a long time to find the simple answer, <laughs> Martin. It took days and days and days, and yeah. I might just as easily have missed it. If it hadn't been for that one cent, you know, I mean, you're reading through medical journals all, day after day after day, scanning through them. You yeah. can easily miss a sentence and all of that. Yeah. I'm just visualizing how all of our clients are going to be asking for a pH paper and be running around measuring their poop. It's a really important thing to know. Yeah, it is. On, on that... Uh, yes, we could go now into the depths of it. Like as you were describing it, I'm thinking, okay, toward the older age of the person, 
as the gram negative bacteria ratio goes up, you start losing your marbles. You, your thinking is cloudier, your brain recovery is slower, your injury recovery is slower and so on. I mean, all of that seems to tie back to this one thing. So, you know, there's a saying that, uh, that you're, only as, you're only as young as your microbiome, right? Um, when they give in, uh, so in the fecal transplant community, when they were studying fecal transplants, if they gave a fecal transplant of a young rat to an aged rat, the aged rat got younger. And when they gave the fecal matter of a brave rat to a timid rat, the timid rat got braver. So not only are we getting, not only does the, as we get older and the pH goes up and the microbiome goes out, it doesn't just affect you physically and mentally, it also affects you emotionally. It affects your neurotransmitters. It, it, it's, it's a huge topic. All right. I think this talk has been long enough, so let's not make it endless, but I'm really encouraged by what you're putting out there. This is awesome. Congratulations. And let's let's hear it from the crowd out there by the thousands. I've done my short fatty acid enema and I have my health back. Thanks for the opportunity for letting me speak to your audience, Martin. I hope it helps them. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Spencer Feldman at Remedy Link and Martin Patella at Life Enthusiast, life-enthusiast.com. By phone at 866-543-3388. Thank you.